Hi, my name's Mark Padgham. Welcome to this talk on the auto test package. I'll start with a bit of motivation for why this package even exists. I work for R Open Sci, which among other things is an organization that provides peer review for our packages. R Open Sci has been peer reviewing our packages for over seven years, over which time they've reviewed hundreds of our packages um, and improved the software quality of hopefully most of the packages that have been through the peer review process. One of the things that's been learned along the way is that the reviewers are quite often some of the first people to cast a truly external pair of eyes on a piece of software. And in doing so, what they quite often do with software are things that developers themselves might not necessarily have anticipated. And so reviews quite often, not always, but often begin with reviewers coming back to the authors of packages and saying, this looks like a great package. However, I tried to do this with it and something strange happens. Can we first of all work out why it's behaving this way? And reviews get a little bit sidetracked in the early phases into uncovering bugs that, as I said, the developers just um, simply may not have anticipated. And so was born the idea of the auto test package. What the package is, or what it does, is it um, analyzes all of the inputs of all of the functions and mutates those inputs to attempt to uncover um, unexpected behavior or behavior that um, may cause problems through review processes or other users using packages. So it systematically mutates all of the inputs of functions and uh, looks at the result on the output of the function or the behavior of the function itself. The other step that the auto test package does is to examine the documentation of functions and it looks at the kinds of things that are given as inputs and checks whether they match the documentation and also for the outputs ensures that the classes or um, types of output results from functions match the, the um, values given in the descriptions. It does all of this through uh, extracting the examples code in the documentation for every single function and using example code it tries to identify all of the types of inputs thrown at every parameter to a function. So that's enough for an introduction and without further ado, we will now go on to looking at how the auto test package actually works. The auto test package. First of all, the auto test package at the moment lives on GitHub at an organization called R OpenSci Review Tools. And if you simply search for R OpenSci and auto test, you'll find the package will hopefully be on CRAN by the time this talk is actually given. The auto test package in three simple steps demonstrated here. The first thing it needs is the package to test. So it only can, it can only test R packages. So the first two lines here create a simple R package and the third line displays the directory tree where there's an R directory, which is simply empty and the two files necessary for it to be considered an R package. The second step to do is then to add a function. In this case, we just add a really simple function that takes some input X, adds a value of one to it and returns it and add some documentation to that function which when you then run Roxygen Roxygenize command, turns that documentation into a corresponding help entry in the man directory of the package. The third step is simply to auto test the package. So the only function that I will focus on in this talk is one called auto test package, which simply tests the entirety or selected parts of an entire package. So auto pa test package with the path to our um, dummy little R package that we just constructed, returns an object that is of class auto test package, as you see there, but that derives from Tibble, which itself derives from data frame. So it's effectively a, a Tibble data frame. And it has a dimension in this case of one row and nine columns. This doesn't look very nice printed on a screen like this. You can see the results look something like this and the nine columns are kind of a bit messy, but the one that we're interested in here is the uh, third last one down in the bottom line there, that's content. And if you focus in on the content alone, this content column tells you the content of the message that auto test issues in response to a test. And this says, this function has no documented example. I said at the start that in order for auto test to work, to work, each function needs to have examples. These are the things that are analyzed and extracted in order to identify all the parameters that are input into functions. So you need to add an example, right? We do that by modifying our function that looked like this with documentation at the top, adding two more lines that has an example where the value of X in this example is equal to one. We then run Roxygen to update the documentation. Once again, run auto test package. And in this case, you'll see in the first section up the top below auto test demo, there's a little tick there and saying that one out of one functions was successfully auto tested, my function. And in this case, the content of the results has two lines. 
Now the first line says that the parameter X is not specified as an integer, yet it's only used as such and gives advice there to use one L to explicitly specify an integer. And the second um, content entry in the result says that that parameter X is only used as a single numeric value, but it responds to vectors of length greater than one. Right, so what we can then do to our function to address those issues, there are a whole lot of things that we could do, but one, for one way, for example, would be to restrict it to X to being an integer by modifying the documentation line to have one L and using the checkmate package, which is just provides a very easy and very fast way to um, implement assertions on inputs in a single line. Assert int says, I expect the argument X to be a single valued integer parameter. So we then update the documentation, run auto check again, and now the content says, one line this time, so we're down from two back to one, the parameter X permits unrestricted integer inputs, but it doesn't document this, so please add the word unrestricted to the description. As said at the start, all the parameters are matched to corresponding description entries and attempts given to make sure that they make sense without being too prescriptive about how to do that. The simple word unrestricted is sufficient here. So now we take the documentation once again and modify it to say an unrestricted integer input run Roxygen to update the documentation again. And this time, Autotest successfully checks the function and returns nothing or a null value. So this reflects the fact that when Autotest works, it should do nothing. So it's a package that should help you write robust and much more bug-free code by applying it throughout the development process and ensuring that um, the Autotest package function returns nothing at all. Then you know that you're coding in a very robust way. Of course, we'd like to know which tests are actually run. So the test previously, we set this parameter test equals true, and the default value is actually test equals false. If we set that for our function that we've written here, it returns nine tests. Don't worry about the details there, but they list all of the actual tests that are conducted. And you can see on the left, the first uh, column is called type, and that tells you the type of test. When tests are not run, that type is simply dummy to indicate that they're not run. When they are run, the results can be errors or warnings or um, diagnostic errors, which um, develop as a um, can, may consider in order to modify their package. The other column of interest here is test name, which in this case, remember the parameter X was an integer parameter. And so some of the tests that are constructed are to examine the input, the, the acceptable range of that input to convert the int to a numeric, to convert a single value int to a length of two, and all of these tests pass successfully. And then the remaining tests from um, four onwards are all about matching documentation of input parameters and of return values. What we can also do, for example, is change the function from a, um, an integer to a numeric value. So instead of one L and assert int, we can have one with a dot to say it's a numeric value and assert number, this time expecting a single value numeric input. If we do that and look at the types of tests, you'll see that those integer tests don't appear anymore, but tests that are relevant to numeric parameters appear, such as the second one, for example, trivial noise, where trivial noise is added to the input with the expectation that that should not affect the result. So that's all well and good for a simple trivial function, but how about a real world example? The auto test package can also be um, applied to any package as well as, as mentioned at the outset, a selected set subset of functions from a package. So here, for example, the code in the top box there applies the function with test equals false to initially just list the tests that would be run to the variance function of the stats package. When we do that, the uh, first output there indicates that four functions are actually run. So the package works, as said, by documenting example code. These are held in RD files, and one RD file, which is the name of the files in the man directory, can hold code for or can document several functions at once. So the variance function is documented in the same file as the covariance function and the correlation function. So all of these are tested at once when you put any one of them in as functions, and the result has 150 rows, indicating that 150 tests will be applied to all of these functions if we set the parameter test equal to true. When we do that, it takes around 20 to 30 seconds on most computers to run and generates 15 rows of result. We look at those 15 rows here, you can see on the uh, type column at the top that the first two of those are warnings and the remainder of them are diagnostic parameters. Now, Throughout the documentation of auto test, it's recommended to use the DT package from our studio to visualize these results in an interactive HTML table because these tables can be quite overwhelming to try to look at 
and read on screen. DT offers a much con more convenient interface for understanding the results. When you do that, in this case, you'll see that the two warnings are about parameters for which the usage has not been demonstrated. The first of those is the use parameter of the variance function and also the y of the covariance function. So these are the usage of these is not actually demonstrated in the documentation and the remainder are diag diagnostic messages, in this case all about parameters being case dependent. So that may be considered perfectly acceptable by developers or they might like to simply eliminate those diagnostic messages and think well I could actually match those arguments regardless of case and then those um, messages wouldn't even appear. But in this case, at least the two warnings ought to be taken seriously. So from 150 tests applied to the stats package, sorry, the 150 tests applied to the stats package, if we want to look at all of those with the DT table, you'll see again, the type is dummy on the left there. And this tells you all when you look at it yourself, which you can easily do all of the tests that are actually thrown at this function. They are result involve mutating the single logical values, mutating vector inputs, scrolling down through the table. You can see that um, the lower rows there, check that the description of return objects matches the observed values. Going down a bit further, um, you can see that the a lot of tests are about matching the parameters to the documentation. And then finally, this illustrates one more important aspect of the auto test package that for inputs um, that have particular class attributes, such as um, data frame inputs, it then mutates those class attributes in certain ways, depending on the type of input um, with expectations of what a function should actually do. So in this case, rectangular or tabular kind of inputs, such as data frames are converted to tibbles and converted to data tables with the expectation that that shouldn't change function um, results. So the stats package is algorithmically robust. Autotest does not reveal any algorithmic problems whatsoever, but it does reveal a few gaps in documentation which could and maybe should be addressed in order to make the stats package more robust and ultimately user friendly. Now, just to conclude, I will show a package which generates much more rich array of warnings and errors, and it's one of my own packages. I'm about to do something nasty and reveal a way in which a package is not coded very well at all. And so, of course, it's only fair that I choose my package, which prior to this talk, I had not applied auto test to. Geodist has algorithms coded in C that are algorithmically, I would hope, very, very robust, but I perhaps didn't give as much thought to the R user interface as what I might have. So you can see here that 157 tests will be thrown at this package, which has effectively only one main exposed function and three or two auxiliary functions that come out of it. So the uh, results here of the 157 functions show you the sorts of things that will be done, mutating single logical values, substituting characters for them, um, submitting vectors of length greater than one for um, inputs that are assumed to be single valued and things like that. Um, and custom class definitions for vector inputs. So changing the classes of them as well. And um, what this shows at the end is that um, auto testing the GeoDisk package reveals one error, two warnings and 26 diagnostic messages. Some of these are that the input classes are not actually documented, the parameter types are not checked appropriately. So um, back on those results, if you run, you can easily run this yourself. Um, it shows that you can put character parameters where um, logical parameters are expected. The parameter lengths are not checked. So submitting vectors of length greater than one to single value parameters doesn't generate any warnings or errors. And numeric parameters are only demonstrated as integers. And finally, return objects are not described. So the auto test package reveals an awful lot of ways in which I, as the developer of this geo test package, could actually improve the package, making it more robust and much more user friendly. And so to conclude, the auto test package is sufficiently developed to be usable for most people, hopefully, has been extensively tested. And the recommendation is that auto tests should be used from the first moments of package development, in which case it should be relatively robust. So like in the first example here, if you start off with a trivial function and then you just concentrate on ensuring that auto test generally returns null um, every time that you run it then that, that usage should be sufficiently robust, but application to existing packages may not always work straight away. And so please let us know of any problems and we'll endeavor to fix them. And finally, this um, package is available along with other packages to aid the general review process at a GitHub organization called RopenSci Review Tools. Thank you very much. It was um, quite challenging. It was not the tests. So the tests at the moment are relatively restricted, the sets of tests that are run, but it's fairly modular. So 
once it's sufficiently stable, then implementing more tests should be relatively straightforward. But the most challenging thing was trying to work out from the example code what people are actually putting into functions. And that requires parsing the example code to identify every input. And especially in an era where people use pipes all the time, that input might actually be constructed lines and lines beforehand. And you have to work out what it is and what all the transformation steps are, and then separate that input out from the actual function call to identify it. And that was really quite challenging doing all of that. Good, so congratulations for doing that. Another um, question, can, can uh, auto generate tests for the test directory? No. No, it can't at the moment um, because I am waiting for it to be used enough to know that it's sufficiently robust before I roll that out. And I also would love to hear feedback from anybody about whether they think that's a good idea. I've done it for a few packages and got auto test to automatically construct tests. And you can, in basically one line of code, get a test coverage of 50 to 70% for your package with a black box, you don't know what you've done there. And I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or not. And so what I really am looking forward to is hearing input from people about whether they even think that that's a good thing to do. You can just automatically achieve, depending on the type of package, but 50, 60, 70% test coverage with one line of code. It and will how do at some stage. And so people, you can um, uh, give feedback in the Slack channel as well as in the repository of the package, I suppose. Where do you want to get feedback, Mark? So you might, where, where do you expect to receive feedback from uh, users? Uh, uh, um, I'm not sure. I guess on, on GitHub, on the package itself, or through our open side channels. Good, and you can also uh, keep the discussion going in the Slack channel of the session um, in the Slack Absolutely. Yeah. space. Uh, one last uh, question. So um, does Autodesk have similar functionalities to our common check? So will it test um, all examples, check for types and overrunning? So how does it compare to our common check? Our command check only runs examples exactly as they're written. And as long as nothing goes wrong, then it won't notice anything, it won't mention anything. Auto test separates out all the inputs for every function and mutates those inputs. So it's completely different. It's doing a lot more than an R command check. If you have X equals one, it takes X equals one and it tries to submit X equals the biggest integer possible and X equals the most negative integer possible and X equals a vector with length. It, it mutates all of the inputs. And so it's really quite different to R command check. It's doing a lot more in terms of trying to break your package. Thank, thank you. And I hope uh, you will get a lot of feedback on the package. Um, yeah, I'm really paper. looking forward to it. Please, any feedback at all and any usage, please use it and uh, give me feedback after usage. Um, thank you. And um, so we'll it is now time for our next speaker, we, who is another Mac, Mac van der Lo, who will speak about the uh, tiny test package, a fresh look at unit testing. Hello, and thank you for joining my talk. My name is Mark, and in this uh, video, I would like to talk about a package that I've been working on for the last two, two and a half years called TinyTest. During this video, I will show you some slides and I'll also do some live demos. And if you would like to repeat the demos that I show you, then you can download all the materials that you need in the, from the link uh, in the bottom of this page. So the word TinyTest uh, consists of, of two parts. Uh, one is tiny. Uh, this refers to the fact that TinyTest is a very small dependency-free package. So if you install the package, you need nothing else except packages that come uh, with base are installed already. And the second part, test, um, refers to the fact that TinyTest is a unit testing package. So let me first um, tell you something about unit testing. So in unit testing is a way to measure the quality of your source code. And it does, in, in unit testing, you do this by comparing uh, the output, the actual output of function, of functions, function calls, with the output that you expect. So here's an example. There's a function called add1 that actually adds two. And I have a function from a tiny test package called expect equal. And I compare the output of add1 of one with the expected output two. Well, the output doesn't match. So I get a message that says this test failed. Some data is inconsistent. This is the test call, and here's what I expected and what I got. 
Before I continue, let me just comment on what the status of the package currently is. We uh, released the first uh, issue or the first release of, of this package was in April 2019 on Chrome. Uh, we've had 10 releases since that. At the moment of recording this video, uh, 160 packages on CRAN or Bioconductor are using TinyTest as their unit testing suite. It's also supported by PackageKitten. Uh, that's a package which allows you to set up um, a package infrastructure uh, real quickly, including everything you need to use TinyTest in your package. If you'd like to know something more about the programming methodology that sits behind uh, TinyTest, then I invite you to um, take a look at this R journal paper uh, that will appear soon, but is now available on uh, archive. Before I continue, I would really uh, like to stop uh, for a moment and thank all these people that have influenced uh, the development of the package. I've had tremendous um, help from people that either supported features or inspected my code, came with a pull request, uh, provided documentation on how to mock databases. A big thank you uh, from here. Of course, I also like to thank the people at Cron that uh, maintain an awesome infrastructure, which is incredibly important for the success of R. In the rest of this video, I want to show you a few, uh, well, first I will show you the basic setup, and then I will show you a few features that I think set TinyTest apart from other um, unit testing packages. And this includes, you can test, uh, tests travel are installed with the package. You can test in parallel, and you can, uh, a tiny test can track side effects. So let's look at the basic setup of the package. So here's the um, directory infrastructure for a package called My Package, and it has all the usual elements like a description file, a namespace file, uh, a folder with R code, a mon file with um, the manual uh, entries. And then to use tiny test, you need to add two things. One is you need to add a single file under the tests directory. And you add one line of code that says uh, test package, my package. So, and this makes sure that when you run our command check, all the tests in the package are actually uh, run. And the unit tests themselves sit in a folder under inst. Here I am uh, in a bash shell in the, in the package uh, directory that I just showed you. I'm going to start a new R session, load time test. Now, if I want to um, build and uh, install and test the package, there's a function in, in tiny test for that called uh, build install test. And when it does, it actually calls R command build. It then installs the package in a temporary directory under your temp folder, goes to that directory, loads in the package in a separate new uh, empty R session, and then runs all the tests. So this ensures that you run all the tests in a clean R environment that's not hampered with option settings that you might have uh, loaded or, or functions or other variables and, and code that you loaded in your interactive session. So you see some output uh, while the tests are running. It reports how many tests it has run, how many fails it has detected, how long things took. And if it detects failures, then uh, a report is printed at the bottom. And in this case, we see that one test has failed. There's something wrong with the data. So that means there's something wrong with the actual output, the values um, that came out and not the attributes of the, of the objects that were produced. Uh, it reports in what file something went wrong and then what lines of that file something went wrong. It gives you the expectation call, so the actual test call, and gives you a small report on what um, actually uh, was expected and um, versus what was obtained. Um, so now that we found out that something is wrong in the, in the, in the test quad, uh, or an, an error was detected in the test quad file, uh, we may want to um, reproduce that, uh, that test interactively. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to source my R code to make sure it's in the interactive session. And then I'm going to run this uh, single test file interactively. Okay, and I get the same output. 
So um, I see that the fun that there's something wrong in, in add one. And what I can do is I can go to my uh, code, which is here. This I've opened the my code.r. I find the bug, I repair it, and I source again and run test final see everything is fine. Right? Just says all okay for results for this single file. Now it's also possible to um, run um, all the files in a directory uh, all at once, uh, interactively. So, uh, and I want to show one other feature. So I can actually store the results. So I can run test directory, uh, it sits under inst, tiny test, and I run it. And I again, I get uh, the reporting while tests are running, which is really quick in this case, but uh, the output, and this is something um, that I think is a nice feature of TinyTest, um, the test results are data. So for example, I can summarize my output and get a nice table that shows how many results were obtained in each file, uh, how many fails, how many passes, and it can report some other things that I will talk about a little bit later. So, and you can also turn this thing into a data frame uh, so you can just call s.data.frame um, of out and then you can write that for example to a database uh, in a circumstance where you run tests for example automatically and you want to store all the test results um, and export them to a system for later inspection. Now the next feature I would like to demonstrate uh, real quickly is uh, that tests in TinyTest in principle travel with the package. As you've seen, you have to put your unit tests under inst tinyTest in your package infrastructure. And the advantage of that is that any if somebody installs your package, they can and they also install tinyTest, then they can uh, run any test that you actually added to your package. So let me just uh, demonstrate how that works. If I have, I have TinyTest loaded and I'm going to uh, test one of the packages that uses TinyTest. We do this with test package. Uh, the validate package is one of the packages that's being tested using TinyTest. The package is loaded and all tests, and you see there are a bit more tests here, are uh, run and it says all okay, uh, almost uh, 400 results. So the advantage of this is, uh, especially for package authors, is that uh, you can ask any user to rerun all the tests that you wrote locally. Right? So they may sit on an infrastructure that's a little bit different from your own, or maybe even a little bit different from one of the many infrastructures that's tested on CRAN. Um, so you can, uh, at least when somebody reports a bug, you can ask somebody to run all the tests again and see if they have uh, there's something different. TinyTest makes it real easy to run multiple tests in parallel. So if you have say four test files, you could uh, use run test there with the uh, argument ncpu equals four, and then it would start up four separate R sessions that each run one of the files. So let me just demonstrate that uh, for you. Uh, using um, test package on the validate package. So I run all the tests in the validate package. So four workers are being set up and all the test files are run one by one. So um, it's important to understand that uh, each file uh, should be, so because of this parallelization, uh, feature, it's important that you set up test files in such a way that they run independent from each other. So it is good if you set up your tests in such a way that one file does not expect that another file was run just before it. Other than that, parallelization is real easy with TinyTest. The last feature I would like to talk about is on reporting side effects. A side effect occurs when a function or a script changes something outside of its own scope. So for example, a function might change an environment variable, it could change an option setting in, in your R environment, or add a variable there. 
So in general, you would like to be able to um, detect such side effects whenever you think this is relevant. There are two ways to do this in TinyTest. Either when you call a test runner, like run test file or run test there or a test package, you can give it the option side effects equals true and side effects will be recorded and reported. Or you can add this statement, report side effects to your test file. And I will just demonstrate the last option quickly. So let me just uh, run the test directory like I uh, did before in the my package uh, package. So everything seems to be fine. I'm running a file called test C sort and I'm running test quad.r and there are five results and everything is fine. Now if I go to the test C sort uh, testing file, I can add a report uh, side effects. And now if I run the test again, you see that TinyTest is recording, uh, recording side effects as well. And in this case, you see there's a side effect uh, that affects the locale. So there's a short summary, uh, one line summary always in test C sort on line four. And it tells me that the LC collate locale setting, which affects how strings are sorted depending on language uh, settings. And it was changed from uh, US UTF-8 to the C setting. Conclusion. Uh, TinyTest is, is a small package. It has is built out of less than, I think, 1200, 1300 uh, lines of code. Uh, it's dependency free, so it doesn't import any other package except for uh, packages that already come when you install R. It's very easy to set up. Um, test files are just R scripts. Uh, you can set up everything using Package Kitten. It will give you the complete package infrastructure, including uh, a TinyTest uh, example file. Uh, it supports interactive testing and the whole uh, build install test cycle. Parallel testing is easy. Um, side effects can be tracked, which as far as I know is unique um, in, in testing uh, in, in other, when compared with other testing packages. And another unique feature is that tests travel with a package. So you as a package author can ask users to run all the tests in their local environment or looked at it from the other way, you as a user can test uh, every package that's being tested with TinyTest at home to uh, check whether everything does what you want it to do. Thank you for watching and for any comments or questions, you can post them under the video or uh, contact me via email or via GitHub. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for the interesting talk. We have several people uh, wondering how TinyTest compares to TestFact. So could you please answer this? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Well, I think um, the, the syntax of expressing tests is very similar. So just, it was actually inspired by TestDat. I mean, uh, I think the expect underscore functions are, are an excellent uh, way to express your expectations. Uh, I think the main difference is that uh, TinyTest uh, is a lot smaller. Um, it doesn't do anything except testing. So, for example, there's no things like uh, praising people when all tests are run uh, or saying something like too bad when tests. Because it's, for me, at some point, it becomes a bit uh, uh, a disturbance in, in the command line. Um, and other than that, I think the, the features that I that I mentioned, like parallelization was really built in. So it was really um, set up in such a way that parallelization was easy to, to build. Um, and certainly tracking side effects, I think, is, uh, is unique. Uh, speaking of parallelization, we have someone asking whether uh, it works on Windows as well. Uh, yes, yeah, this is uh, independent of uh, what operating system you use. Okay, I was wondering how you get colors in the command line. So how in your demonstration, you had colors for the messages. So what gives the colors? Ah, your... um, well, you can use uh, the crayon package for that uh, if you want. Uh, but there are um, special escape codes in, in ASCII. 
you begin with backslash square bracket m and then a number and that tells you from here the color should be for example red yeah cool thanks uh what was the most challenging part of creating time test um I'd have to think. I think the most challenging part was something I did before. Um, I mentioned in the, in the beginning that I wrote a paper on the method that sits behind tiny test, and that's I developed that method for for another package called Lumberjack, where you can you, you can run a code file, uh, you can run an R file, and while it runs, you can you can tap off some information without disturbing anything. So you have to really separate two pieces of code, um, and where those pieces of code are running very well. And when I solved that for, for the Lumberjack package, I realized it could easily be used also for a test package. So it has a very clean separation between uh, what the test package is doing and what the, the code is actually doing, uh, the, the user code is actually doing. Um, so I think that was hard, at least it took me some hard thinking on how to solve that. But once you have that, idea you can you can use it in multiple ways yeah. okay thank you one last question uh do you know are people using the data frame of their test data for doing cool visualization or calculation on their test i'm not aware of it there there, there is some uh, i have the idea of uh, building in a visualization myself um so during interactive testing you could you could plot your output um, but I haven't seen any feedback from that. My, my first thought was to be able to export the data frame. Right? But uh, I think you could make some interesting plots as well. Uh, oh, and uh, in case you missed it in the Q&A, someone is saying thank you because I used TinyTest um, in the introductory uh, programming course extensively. Yeah. Oh, nice to hear. Thanks. And uh, people, you can uh, keep asking questions uh, in the uh, Slack channel, um, so you can keep the discussion going um, going on uh, there. And it's uh, soon uh, time for our next speaker, uh, Sebastian Rochette from Thinkar, who is going to talk about his Fusain package. Thank you. So you should be able to see my uh, presentation, which is uh, called Use Fusain to write or upgrade a package. Um, today, I will uh, present Fusen um, mostly to people who already develop uh, packages, uh, just to, to change the way I, I present it and to, to see how it can address your challenges inside the uh, existing packages already. So this presentation is already available on my GitHub. If you, if you are not able to, to follow it now, you can have it uh, as a PDF. Why did I uh, develop Fusen is to save some time because uh, I, I want people to be able to write the code uh, and the documentation at the same time. Usually you let the documentation for the end. So first, who am I? Uh, I am uh, Sébastien Rochette. Uh, I work at ThinkOr and we are doing uh, um, uh, teaching or and also consultancy. And if you want to know more about what we do, we have our website, GitHub, Twitter, and I also have my personal website and personal Twitter if you want to, to follow me or to follow us. But let's go back to this presentation. When you are a developer, you need to think about many things when you are building your own package if you want uh, future user, uh, users to be able to use it. So the different question of the users could be, what does the package do? Or how to install a, the package and the different dependencies. And for that, you know that you have to fill the uh, information inside the description file. If you want to answer the question, what are the functions of the package? How to fill the different parameters of the function? Or can I have an example on how to use this uh, specific function? You know that you will have to go inside the org directory and open the script file and add the information inside in the or oxygen skeleton, for instance. The other function you can have is, OK, how can I have a whole example of uh, how to use the package? Maybe the different functions are not uh, uh, working, are working in the specific uh, order. And for that, you will write some vignettes inside the uh, Markdown file and to explain how to use the different functions and with some text. And then you can have the, the question like, um, 
will your package work with my last ver version of R or with the last version of the different dependencies of this, uh, of this package? And to ensure that uh, uh, your package will be able to work in the future, you add some tests, maybe with tiny tests or, or test that, or, and uh, you will have to set uh, the continuous integration so that uh, you help yourself for the future. So you see, when you are building a package as a developer, you have to think about at least these four different places to store code and documentation and examples in different places. But what I would like to ask you is why not prepare all of this, the code, the example, the test and the documentation inside a unique file in the same place so that you don't have to switch between different places. That's what Fusen is uh, about. Fusen allows to write everything in the same place. You first write your uh, R Markdown with everything inside. You follow the folding lines uh, to be sure that uh, it is written in the correct way. And then you inflate the R Markdown and Fusen will build it uh, uh, as a package. It's like a origami, you know, when you have this uh, little piece of paper that you want to fold, to fold it, you have to follow the, the folding lines because it's very specific the way you do it. And at some point, when you have finished that, you inflate it and you have this beautiful package that is made because of uh, the good uh, folding lines. So Fusen is exactly that. To follow Fusen folding lines, uh, you will have uh, to make Fusen aware about these different places I already spoke about, like the description, the R directory, the test directory, and the vignettes. For that, for Fusen to be able to distinguish between these different places, the folding lines is a, a template R Markdown file. So if you want to try it, just create a new project, a new directory with nothing inside, and then you run Fusen add dev history. This will add in your uh, project, in your uh, directory, a new file, which is called devhistory.rmarkdown.rmd and with a specific template already filled to help you yourself to, to follow the, the lines. You can see inside this template that there are these four different places, like the description, the function, the example, and the test in the same place. And they are divided by chunks, named chunks. So the names uh, are here to help Fusen to know where it will put the different, uh, the different uh, part of the code. And then you inflate. So just go to the down to, to the bottom of the of the file. You run Fusen inflate. You inflate the specific uh, Markdown file you just uh, wrote, and uh, Fusen will uh, distribute the different uh, pieces of code in the correct places to make it. Uh, be a correct package. So the description chunk will go in the description file, the functions will go in the function file, and the examples will go in different places because you will copy the examples for the examples of the function, but you also will keep it in the vignette. And you have the test will, will go inside the, the test that because for now uh, only uh, test that uh, is used. Is used. Um, so this first part, and then what about the vignette? Indeed, the uh, uh, daily story uh, Markdown is uh, is already a Markdown, is already the vignette. So you will write inside the vignette everything that you have in mind. Say, I would like to write this kind of function. So you write what you have in mind. I will do the function that does this and how to use it. Then you write the chunk of the function, you write the example, you write the test, and Fusen will keep the text that you already uh, wrote and will add the example inside the, the, the vignette directory so that you don't have to copy paste this single example in multiple places. Fusen does it for you. Why I did that is because um, uh, uh, I used to switch between these different places and uh, reducing the number of copy pasting file open and file switch uh, really helps to to focus on on one uh, on on one uh, task. Also, uh, usually when you build a package, uh, you say, "Okay, I will put the unit test at the end when I, I finished uh, everything. Uh, maybe I don't use uh, auto test each time I, I write a new function." And 
usually you forget about it because you don't have time or say, oh, okay, I, I can't do it, or unit testing is too, is too difficult. So as you have everything inside the same file, you, you cannot let the test uh, at the end. You will do it at the same time while you write your examples. And you also write the documentation as you code. I mean, nobody is asking, asking you to have a perfect uh, vignette with everything uh, correctly explained the first time. But at least you wrote everything you had in mind when you wanted to, when you presented the function. And um, you don't wait for the end of your package and to keep everything in mind, what uh, you want to write in the vignette for the end of the package in six months, maybe. So you don't have a, a head big enough to keep all this documentation. Just write it uh, while you code. Then how do you, can you add uh, new functionalities uh, when you work with Fusel? You can add new functions uh, new family and functions in an existing package, whether the package was uh, built with Fusen or not. I mean, if you have an already existing package and you want to add a new family of function, then you can use, uh, use dev history, fill uh, your new function, your documentation, the, the examples and the unit tests inside, you inflate and it will go in the correct place. Fusen will not uh, delete the function that already exists inside your package. There is a vignette about it if you want, if you want to, to look at it, because I read the documentation before writing the functions. Um, you can uh, re-inflate the dev story as many times as you need. I mean, nobody is waiting for you to write everything correctly the first, the first uh, time. So when you do the check, you will probably see some uh, mistakes, and then you go back to the directory, you modify the function, you modify the examples, and um, you can uh, you can do uh, you can reinflate uh, the, the the file, and it will uh, uh, this time it will delete the the files that you already wrote before. I mean, the, with the same functions inside. If you want to add uh, new functions or new family, you can add new sections inside the R markdown. So you add a new title and you add new uh, uh, function example and test chunks so that uh, you, can, uh, you can create new, uh, new files inside your package. If you want to see a full uh, working example, you, you can use add the history with name full, which shows an example of uh, a working example uh, with uh, a package with multiple functions and sub functions too. So it will also show you how to add internal functions that are used inside your exported function. You can add multiple dev stories. You don't have to have a dev story with a uh, hundred and thousand of lines. I mean, you can create a new dev story and for, to, to be able to add new functionalities, it will be easier to maintain. And note that each dev story will be the new vignette inside your package. So if you have a new family of functions, don't hesitate to add a new dev story to, to structure your, your documentation. And there is a specific template for that, uh, which is named additional, uh, which will add only the chunks for function example and test uh, empty chunks so that you can directly code inside. As a bonus, you don't have to think too much about dependencies with Fusen because it will uh, look inside your package, uh, everything you need, every uh, dependencies and add it directly in the description file because it uses uh, the package attachments uh, behind the scene. And if you want to see an example of a package that was built with Fusen, Fusen itself is built with Fusen. It means there is a dev story file inside uh, Fusen uh, that I use to uh, add the new functions and uh, that I inflate to add the new function inside uh, Fusen. And since yesterday, when I started to try to send it to the crowd, uh, I continued to modify the things inside the dev story. At some point, I just switched yesterday because of, you will see uh, one point where you have to switch within the dev story and doing the, the normal uh, way of building a package. This is up to you. I already had common questions about, uh, about Fusen. It's like, you can reorganize the vignette if you want, just go back to the dev story, modify the different sections if you want, and it will modify the vignette. You can reorganize between the vignettes. Um, 
uh, if you want, but at some point maybe you want to lock the modification of uh, daily story, right? Just write a, a comment inside that. Do not inflate anymore. Just do it uh, as usual, and you can uh, write uh, uh, documentation in a normal way. If you want to debug, I mean, you are in a, a Markdown, so if you write function, you can debug in the in the global environment, or you can use the uh, debug once or browser uh, any function you already know on how to to debug. And if you already have a, a package that you want to um, put back inside the uh, Markdown file, it is currently not possible. There is no deflate function. But if you want to participate in the writing of this kind of function to to put back uh, uh, the code you have in uh, in the R file and test file and vignette, you can uh, participate if you want. But for, if you want to do that now, you will have to copy paste uh, the thing uh, by yourself. You can teach FullSend to new developers, and there is a template, uh, a simplified template for teaching if you want, and you can follow this. Uh, package I built on my own GitHub, which uh, uh, specifies the different steps to give to the new developers if you want to, to teach it. I will do it tomorrow in the tutorial, so some of you will be able to see it. So give Fusen a try for your next uh, awesome functionality or your next package, and tell me if you like it or not, and how I can improve it uh, if uh, needed. And uh, uh, what I want to, to tell you uh, to, to conclude is that Use R Markdown first for every project. You can use now Fusen to do it. If you're a new developer and you already write Markdown file, you already have part of a package, so you will almost uh, only have to inflate it following the guidelines. And document and test as you write your, your code, as you write your function, write the example as you try them, and write the unit test as you add new possibilities. Um, uh, everything in the same place so that you don't have to think about what you will do in six months when it will be finished. Sync package with Fusen. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sebastian, for the cool presentation. Um, we have someone uh, asking for clarification on how you write your unit tests with, uh, in the dev history file. So how does it look like? Um, um, currently, I use uh, test that to write the unit test. So inside the, the, the chunk, you have the test that function, which is called, and then inside the expect, uh, expect uh, things. So if you have a look at the main template, if you use Fusen at the history, you will see some example of uh, how to use this, uh, this test. So inside this chunk is exactly the code that you would write inside the OR file in, uh, in test. Thank you. How do you test Fusen? Like, how does do you, the unit test of Fusen look like? The one that tests your Fusen package? Um, it's quite tricky because uh, I have to build uh, external projects that build themselves a package. And there is something cool, uh, cool inside the use this package, uh, uh, which uh, allows to, to test uh, a new uh, directory. So. Inside, uh, uh, use this uh, uh, with this uh, use this function. I can test in a, uh, the build the correct building of a package inside a new environment. I just don't remember. The, it's uh, use this with project. Try Thank you for that. Remember that you can use the Q and A button to the attendees to ask question. There is a question about whether there is native support for things like RCTP packages. Um. No, I mean, I never used RCPP myself, so I didn't think about it. Uh, I don't know how it, what it needs to be able to work, but you need to remember that what you write inside the chunk, which is called function, is what you would write inside the, the R script, uh, inside the R directory. And uh, then I know that in RCPP you have to change some things inside the description too, but I do not know much uh, with that to, to be able to give you a correct uh, answer. How would you know a package used for saying to, uh, like on CRAN, how would you recognize packages that have been created with Fusain? Um You would recognize it uh, if there is a dev directory inside. I mean, the dev directory is, um, 
is the a way we, we we use that thing or uh, first for Golem. So if you already use Golem for Shiny application, you will see this dev, uh, directory, which is the documentation of the developers. So it basically, it's a function you use to reuse for all of your packages. So if you have a dev uh, directory inside your package, it's either a Golem or a Fusen, or you follow <laughs> our, our line. So you can uh, write analytics for the usage of the two packages. Um, I think it's soon time to wrap up the, the session. Um, thank, thanks again to, for, to all the speakers for the interesting talk and uh, the discussions can um, keep happening in the Slack channel talk packages too. Um, Mayim, could you share the final slide of the session? Yes, yes thanks for attending this uh, session. Uh, coming next is at um, 10 uh, 15 UTC is a yoga session with church for karma meditation as well as an LEDs community meeting. And after that, uh, the next session are um, uh, sorry. So the next uh, session are about uh, trends, markets, and models. Another one about database and spatial applications. So we hope you find uh, someone interesting uh, for you. And thanks again to all the speakers for this very interesting session. Thank you.